Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. <laughs> Good afternoon. So most of you have probably wondered what you actually need to do in order to get a Nobel Prize. And <laughs> Uh, so uh, you'll certainly hear one possible route, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately that route has been already taken. <laughs> and more, more seriously, you know, this uh, stable matching is a favorite in many places, and uh, in particular here at MSR, you, many of you probably know the beautiful pictures that Ander has uh, drawn that relate to stable matching, but now we'll hear the real story of how it started in many of the connections. Uh, so we're very happy to have Professor Neyman from the Hebrew U tell us about it. Thank you. So uh, first an apology. None of the work that I'll be talking to you is my own work. But at the Hebrew University, we have a tradition that whenever somebody uh, gets the Nobel Prize in economics and is working in game theory, one of us, the game theorist, presents it to the general uh, audience of the mathematicians. And uh, Yuval recruited me to do the same out here. So uh, I'll uh, present uh, this work. That's uh, uh, the 2012 Nobel Prize in economics. And let me start with the press release, because the press release almost says it all, yes, and for those who don't know anything, at least you could read this press release and uh, know something about it. So stable allocations from theory to practice, and indeed this price was from theory, a small corner in game theory, it's theory, and it's practice. And they say, this year's prize concerns a central economic problem, how to match different agents as well as possible. For example, students have to be matched with schools and donors of human organs with patients in need of a transplant. How can such matching be accomplished as efficiently as possible? What methods are beneficial to what group? The prize rewards two scholars who have answered these questions on a major journey from abstract theory on stable allocation to practical design of market institutions. And it goes on, it uh, credits uh, first Lloyd Chapley, then a lot. Uh, Lloyd Chapley used cooperative game theory to study and compare different matching methods. The key issue is to ensure that the matching is stable in the sense that two agents can be found who would prefer each other over their current counterparts. Shapley and his colleagues derived specific methods, in particular the so-called gale shapley algorithm that always ensures a stable matching. These methods also limits agents' motives for manipulating the matching process. Shapley and Gale were able to show how the specific design of a method may systematically benefit one or the other sides of the market. Essentially, everything that is written here uh, will be proved and emphasized in this talk. Uh, let me just say, I, I'll continue with the press release on Al Roth, but just a few words about uh, Lloyd Chapley. Uh, in the game theory community, we, are, we were expecting Lloyd Chapley to be the first one to receive a Nobel Prize in economics for his work of game theory, and not necessarily for this work. He has several other important works, each one, uh, at least in my view, is uh, at least as important, if not more, than this one. And uh, let's go to the second part of the uh, reward for Alvin Watt that recognized the Shapley theoretical results could clarify the functioning of important markets in practice. In a series of empirical studies, Roth and his colleagues demonstrated that stability is the key understanding the success of particular market institutions. Roth was later able to substantiate this conclusion in systematic laboratory experiment. He also helped redesign existing institutions for matching new doctors with hospitals, students with schools, and organ donors with patients. 
These reforms are all based on the gale Shapley algorithm, along with modifications that take into account specific circumstances and ethical restrictions, such as the preclusion of side payments. So also a word about Al Roth. He was really a driving force for like 30 years. He was running with this topic and trying to pursue everywhere that he could go, in school admissions, in hospitals, in, uh, uh, in, in the matching in the, of uh, interns into uh, hospitals. He was really going in the, with the armor and trying to apply and modify wherever needed this type of initial uh, algorithms into the practical world. Just not in faculty appointments. Hmm? Just not in faculty appointments. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, you're right, but there are some, uh, I'll touch on it later because there are many externalities. And all this work doesn't work when there are externalities and one is to modify things. And, uh, uh, I'll tell you later, at the very end, if there will be a nice story when I'll come to show that everything is part of game theory, a nice story of uh, your old department, the Matt Institute in Jerusalem, when there was an issue of recruiting and uh, some comment of Auman that uh, showed that basically you could mix everything, all the decision all together, <laughs> if you expect, accept some principles of uh, admission. And even though these two researchers worked independently of one another, the combination of sharply basic theory and Roth's empirical investigation, experiments, and practical design have generated a flourishing field of research and improved the performance of many markets. This year's prize is awarded for an outstanding example of economic engineering. So that's really a type of, uh, we call it game theory engineering, but it's economic engineering, that you take some, something from theory and you really engineer it to the real world Whenever is, there is a need for a small adaptation, you do the small adaptation. But let us go to the starting point. The starting point was a paper by David Gale and Lloyd Chapley in 1962. Uh, uh, and uh, let me explain first the problem by an example. I would assume, let me maybe take here a vote. Who knows this paper, the Chapley, the mechanism? Who doesn't know? Would, oh, few doesn't know. Of course, I'll go quickly on the model from A to Z and stop me if you think I'm rushing too fast or speed me up if you think I'm going too slow at the first part of the talk. So there are three men, alpha, beta, gamma, and three women, A, B, and C. A matching in this particular setup, it, the one-to-one -one would not be the right concept in later applications is a one-to-one -one function from the set of men to the set of women. But we are interested, so if you look on matching, just uh, it's all the permutations, you could list them. And each man has a preference order over the woman, and each woman has a preference, so that's an example of a preference, just the notation, how I write the preference. And each woman is a preference order over the men. So here is an example of woman A, woman B, and woman C of their preferences over the men's alpha, beta, and gamma. And a stable matching are matchings where there is no unmatched couple preferring each other to their mates. Very simple. Is that clear what's a stable matching? Because if we don't understand that, we will be lost in the sequel. And later, I'll maybe like try already hear words, even if it's not understood, I'll explain it later, it is exactly what we call the core of a cooperative game. Okay, so it's a, an instance of a model where the core just reduces to this simple definition of what is called a stable. So let us con continue the example that we just mentioned. If you would have looked, if you would have looked of the preference and you remember them, I don't, here is the preference, so uh, men alpha prefers, his first ranking is A, woman, then B, then C, beta first is B, then C, then A, gamma first choice is C, second A and third is B, and similarly the second column presents the preference of the 
women over the men. And let us look on the red example. This is not stable because uh, gamma and A are not matched, but gamma prefers A on B on his matched one, is ranked 2 compared to 3, and A prefers gamma on, uh, on alpha, whose air match, and therefore this is not a stable matching. And if you look on the following matching, this is a stable one. And if you want, I'll go over the details, but I think it's not needed. And uh, let's look on another example. Here we have uh, four men and four women. And the question is, is there a stable matching? So most of you know the solution finally, but a priori it was a question. Is there a stable matching? And you could ask the same question, is there a separate matching for three, for four, for five, or for any number of men and women? You could ask this question. I must confess that I was feeling very bad as an undergraduate when I was unable to solve this question when it was posed to me by Perles. And uh, especially after seeing the solution, I said, well, come on, maybe I should leave mathematics if I couldn't solve that. And then when I met uh, uh, Gail, in uh, 78, I think, I told him the story. He said, oh, don't be so frustrated. I was struggling with this problem for many years and asking many mathematicians. None could have solved it. I sent the letter to Lloyd Chapley, and in return mail the next day I got the answer. <laughs> so uh, once you see the solution, once you know about it, you say, how could you miss it? Yes. Mm -hmm. I think even if you will tell somebody that there is an algorithm, it's already an int and then you will prove. But usually a mathematician would ask, is there one? And you don't necessarily think of building an algorithm. So the red matching is not uh, stable. Uh, here are the, all the pairs, the blue ones that could uh, are unmatched and would prefer each other to their own mate. Let's us look just on one such example. Let's, let's say the C and beta, they are not matched. But C prefers beta because rank 3 over 4. And beta prefers C over is matched, which is 4, uh, which is B. And this is the unique. In this case, there is a unique stable matching, which is drawn here in the blue. And uh, just uh, to, to tell you the story that it's not a priori so trivial, the problem, even after you will see the proof, you will think it is trivial, is that a priori when you tell somebody, okay, yes, there is a stable matching, then you generalize a little the problem and you see that there need not be a stable matching in very small variant. There is, it's very important that it's two-sided market, what we call. So let's look quickly on what's called the roommate problem. And in the roommate problem, we wish to make two, two person teams from a group of A, B, C, and D. You could think of domes. You have four individuals. They have to be matched in two domes. And each one has a preference of his uh, roommate in the dome. So it's a one side. It's, there is no distinction here between uh, em employees and employers, schools and students, women and men. So one group. And the preference order of each member of, for the partitions, so each one, basically, if it's just four, the preference is exactly on the partition. Because if you partition, if you know who is your roommate, you know everything. In the other cases on the matching, if there are externalities, it's a different story. So the preference here is identical with your own preference over whom you are being matched. So uh, preference A. A prefers B over C over D, B, C over A over D, C over A, and D is independent. So D is the last one in each one of these preference match. There is no stable matching here, because in any stable matching, D will be matched with one of A, B, and C. But each one of them is the top ranked of one of the others, A, B, C. So he will depart with the guy where he is at the top market. So in the roommate problem, there is no uh, stable matching. So existence results, Gale and Chapley, they prove that there always exists a stable matching. And as I said, 
it's obtained by an iterative procedure, a very simple one, a, a two-line description of the algorithm goes in stages. In stage K, each man proposes, Yuval told me that in Microsoft I shouldn't use men and women, but uh, okay. so. No, no, no. Only when you switch to the <laughs> multi yes. I, <laughs> I gave, uh, because this was the Nobel Prize uh, award this year, I started my undergraduate game theory course with uh, this problem, the first lecture. And I was telling the solution, and then in the exam, which I just finished checking, the, 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 was, the, the algorithm was described in so uh, such no. nice words. One would use, uh, he was more attractive, and, <laughs> and one was using, I love him more, or he loves him more. Each one used his own connotation for the story of the machine. So, uh, stage K, each man proposes to his favorite woman among those who have not rejected him in the past. So obviously, in the first day, it means that each one, nobody was yet rejected, so each one applies to the one ranked top. Each woman who receives more than one proposal rejects all, but the favorite from among those who have proposed them. Okay, and now we have to, that's an algorithm, so we have stages when it stops. The procedure stops on the first stage with no rejections. So if there is a given day with no more rejections, it is being stopped. Obviously, this procedure stops in at most 10 square stages at a stable matching, and to see that it's a stable matching, it is one, let me see if I... No, that's it. So, 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 so let me just point to, to two simple arguments in the matching. If you look on the proposed woman for each man, these are decreasing in order. The non-rejected present man at, that is proposing to women is an increasing function. They never go down. They always go up. And therefore, if there would be a man that is not matched with a woman, that prefer each other, it means that the man was visiting this woman on a previous day. But if he was rejected, it means the one that is left there is more preferred by the woman over that. So, let's illustrate the procedure. So here is that previous example where I say that there is a unique one. So the first day, if you look on this uh, algorithm, both alpha and beta are going to the first most preferred, alpha and beta. Gamma goes to B, and delta goes to gamma. The next day, so who is rejected here? Lady A looks on alpha and beta. She prefers alpha, she rejects B. So the red one is the rejected one. So beta goes to his next preference, which is B and so on, and basically that's the longest procedure that could be, this example is to illustrate the longest one, and it's not exactly n square, you could save a little if you want to really think how many steps it takes, but uh, you get here the longest one and you could reiterate that to obtain the longest one and... Uh, okay. Now let's look on variations of the story that I was just telling. First of all, the number of men can differ from the number of women. Nothing will change. Also, the way that I define the stopping of the algorithm is the same. Each woman or college, W, to be politically correct here, we have to switch to colleges, uh, can desire to be matched with KW men students. Okay, so. And a third application, which I haven't seen it much being discussed in the literature, but it's a natural extension, which is true. Each club C can t have KC members, and each person P can be a member of NP different clubs. Okay? And each one of these models, if the preference is indeed without externality, each individual has a reference, 
preference over each one of the other clubs or of the other without. In clubs, usually it's important really for the application who are the other members of the club. Yes, but if, and then it wouldn't work all this type of uh, stability. But in the case that there are no externality, each one is ranking the clubs in his order and uh, who is the first, second, and third, and so on. And each club is ranking each member independently of the others. Then in this case, exactly you could define what is a stable matching in an analogous way and you will get that there is a stable matching. Now let us uh, raise a few issues arising in this setup. One is optimality. Maybe there are several stable matchings. We just proved that there exists one stable matching. Yes. Uh, then bachelor would, if there are more men than women, then some will, be, will remain bachelors. Yes. Uh, can we say something about the set of bachelors in this uh, in such a society in stable matchings? Uh, then there is the issue of incentive compatibility. What is incentive compatibility? It's in general, you, you think, okay, we found an algorithm, so maybe we could uh, ask the matchmaker, we will submit to him our preferences and he will perform his algorithm and generate the match. And the question is, is incentive compatible if there is an incentive for each member to give his true preference and not to bluff by inserting another preference. So incentive compatibility means that given that the others are reporting the true, the truth, then uh, you would like to report your truth as well. And non-strict preference, it's a trivial extension in the story. You want also to, ex to, to include it, but it uh, doesn't cause any difficulty. So, Let's address first the issue of optimality. A college is feasible for a student S if S is matched with C in some stable matching. There could be many. We say there is none. We haven't yet said anything about uniqueness. Okay? Even though in the work of, uh, for different reasons of Yuval and uh, Andre, Anda, Anda uh, there is a stable matching for good reasons, a, a unique stable matching there for a good reason. Uh, so, but there could be more than one and you say that a pair is feasible to each other if there is some stable matching that they are matched. Theorem, I think it's already in the Galen Chapley 62 paper. A college that rejects a student is not feasible uh, feasible for him. So we are looking on the student. The algorithm is called the deferred acceptance algorithm. Yes. So we look here on the proposals by the students to the colleges. And if there is a college that re rejected some student, it's not feasible for him. In, it means there is no other stable matching by which they will be matched. Who knows the proof of that? No. Okay. okay, very few, so I'll give the proof. It's again very simple. But again, it's one of these examples that some people say, oh, I proved it, or I, I know how to prove it, and they have to reconstruct, and they have difficulties with the reconstruction. So it's very short proof. Otherwise, in the student proposing deferred accepting algorithms, there is a first stage where a college C rejects S. So let S1 up to SKC be the students proposing on that day to C and not rejected yet in that stage. Okay. If C is feasible for S, there is a stable matching such that C is matched with S and one of these SJ is matched with C1. But if this is a stable matching, it means it's impossible that we know that C prefers SJ to S. Yes. 
but by stability, it must be that C1 is preferred by this SJ over C. Otherwise, C will go with SJ and will object to this stability. But this implies that SJ was rejected by C1 in an earlier stage and contradiction. Okay, let's look on some corollaries. Some of them are amazing. If you state it a priori and you ask somebody to prove, you will find difficulties. Even though once you see these few lines of proofs, you get a proof of it. Uh, if you look on the deferred accepting algorithm results in a matching which is in which every member X of the proposing side, so there are two sides, the one that proposes and the one that rejects. So is matched with its most preferred feasible partner. So you look on all possible stable matchings, yes, and this algorithm gives the most preferred outcome to the proposing side of the market. And this is because of the previous theorem. Because if not, there is somebody more preferred that will be matched in some feasible, in, in some uh, stable matching. But the previous theorem says that if somebody is rejected, a student is rejected from a college, there is no stable matching by which they are being matched. <coughs> Bachelor would. The set of bachelors is the same in all stable matchings. Okay, if you would look on more men than women, again, give this as an exercise, yes, to a smart mathematician that is unfamiliar with the topic, even though it's all words, everything words, it's... Uh, okay. Um, now let me say, uh, I, I say that there need not be uh, a unique, but you could look on the reverse algorithm. We say students are proposing to the colleges. We could have looked on the opposite example by which colleges are proposing to the students. So maybe it will end up with the same stable matching. So what has been just written on the blackboard on the slides, <laughs> uh, basically shows that if the two side deferred acceptance algorithms result in the same stable matching, there is a single stable matching. But typically, there need not be a same stable matching, a unique stable matching. How much time? Do maybe, maybe a quick side remark. When I first heard this first corollary, I found it kind of shocking because it naively seems as if it's perhaps the wrong way around. Because naively, it seems as if the people who are doing the rejecting, the women in the first case, they are going the up and all the power. And the but it's exactly the opposite. And exactly way correct. Yes. Uh, how much time I have to help plan the... Okay. Uh, and is the pace okay? For you, a little slow, I know. Okay, so incentive compatibility. I already defined what it is when I raised the issue. And uh, uh, there is a theorem. Two places where this theorem is being mentioned are in uh, Dubins and Friedman 81 and Roth 82. I I think I knew about it in the 60s uh, as a problem that Micha Perles assigned in a class, but uh, I don't confess. So, so this came up in various setups. It's not uh, too difficult uh, to prove also. Uh, there is no incentive for a college to unilaterally mi misrepresent its preferences over o order when the college deferred acceptance algorithm is used. So the proposing side, for the proposing sides, there is no incentive ever to change its preference. It is not true for the other side of the market. For the other side of the market, you could co easily cook examples where there is an incentive, given some preferences of the others, to misrepresent its preference. 
uh, wrote in 84, mentioned that there is no stable mechanism for which stating that true preference is a dominant strategy for every agent. So you may think maybe there are other algorithms, other mechanisms that people will have to, uh, to plug in their preferences. Maybe we could cook something more, more sophisticated that will disable an incentive from any side of the market to give, uh, to misrepresent its preferences. But there is none like that. Uh, less well known, I don't know how known this is here to the audience. Yuval, did you knew that? No. No? Okay, so at least yeah, we could... This one. Know the second one, the hmm? This one. And, and Roth and, and Perenson, Roth was basically doing, not only taking the exact theory uh, and trying to improve a set practical designs of some markets, but also when there are flows like the issues of incentive compatibility, uh, which theoretically you could say, okay, they, you cannot avoid them, uh, are they really essential in large markets? Some of the markets are really large. So in, uh, in a paper by Roth and Perenson, they looked on computer simulations with randomly generated data as well as on the data from the national resident matching program. I think one of the first examples of these markets, do you know the story about the national resident matching program? Hmm? The, the, the direction was switched. Yeah. <coughs> in, in accepting uh, interns in two hospitals, there is an old story of how they really did this matching. And it started, uh, basically, the functioning of this market shows that when there are, uh, that this issue of stability causes a lot of instability in these markets. So it started by universities starting to offer earlier and earlier to make the offers to the students, up to reaching a point that I don't remember the year, that they will offer the position to the students in the second year of their study. But then, obviously, they don't know enough information. There is a lot of information, and they require students to give a positive answer at a very early, early stage. Also, the student wouldn't know yet exactly their preferences. And eventually, it was uh, uh, a very noisy market for many years and many switches, and they didn't know what to do until, essentially, they found the gale Shapley algorithm in about 1950s. In the practical way, they did something very similar. Yes. So they looked on the data of this, uh, of this program that they really give the preferences and so on, and also simulated. And it is suggested, and I haven't read this paper, so I don't know what does it mean it is suggested, what, what is really quantified there, that in large markets, very few agents could benefit by manipulating their preferences. So maybe there is the issue of incentive compatibility might be uh, very residual in very large markets. And then there is uh, uh, the previous things are not uh, difficult. Then there is a, a deeper theorem, not a deep, not deep, but a more involved theorem of Dubins and Friedman from 81 that says that not only it is impossible for once member of the proposing side of the market to uh, manipulate his preference. Everyone, if everybody else is recording his correct preference, each one would have to report his own preference, but they also show it for a group of proposals. So there is no coalition of proposers that they could get together in the room and say, okay, we know what are the preferences of the others, let us report different preferences ourselves. Yes, let us report different preferences of ourselves. And once we report that, maybe each one of us will come better off from the algorithm that will match us. And they prove that this is impossible. And I, I think that what happens is a, a small story about that, how those things are usually, you think you have it, and, but then it's, 
you don't get it exactly and uh, you have to I think in 79 uh, Dubins told me that they solved it okay but it took them about two years to reconstruct the proof they couldn't find they were sitting they wanted to write it in 79 they couldn't write the proof yes and then eventually they they, they play with it and uh, they, who who knows this to you? Also new. Okay, okay. So I'm at least happy. I was afraid that I'll. I heard hmm? you, what? I heard it from you, so I'm by, by it. Okay. So 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 so, so just a in for those who want some people enjoy to do the proofs themselves and not necessarily to read the proofs. And many of these proofs would basically uh, go by some clever type of induction. Uh, on va variations of the gale shapley mechanism. If you look on the gale shapley mechanism, usually, okay, there was the story, the shortest path to describe what is going on. But you could do the mechanism in a different way. You don't have to, uh, all, the, all the men proposing on the first day. You could take another order, for instance, yes? Or, or some order, yes? A first man comes into the room, proposes to the, to his most preferred woman. Then, a second candidate enters the room and proposes. If he proposes to the same woman who already has somebody and this lady rejects him, he goes back to the room. And this order, you could play with it, and it's the same outcome as the man proposing algorithm. Okay? So playing with this type of algorithm and doing some clever induction, you get uh, this. Okay. Let me now... Uh, uh, go to few related models. Uh, there is the assignment game by Shapley and Chubik. The assignment game is a game by which also there are economic surplus, like here in matching for two sides of the market, like employers, employees. But in the previous model, there were no side point payments. There were no dowries. Yes. The preference were not on the matching plus dowries or some side payment, but only on the actual <coughs> preference. You are ranking from first to last. And, but in, real, uh, in some situations, like employer-employees, you could basically balance the markets by adjusting the salaries. So they look on the model, which is they call the assignment game, which are two-sided markets, with a surplus utility that is being generated, but by which there is possibility of transferring utility from one to the other. <coughs> Another example is the one-sided one matching yes, of uh, scarf, Shapley and scarf. Again, uh, this is a, general, a more general model than I will describe here. But I think the one that I'll describe here is the one that has been motivating the application to donations of organs uh, in medicine. And this is the sh simple story is the following. You have K individuals. Each one has a house. But their preferences of the houses is not necessarily that you like most your own house. Okay? So mo you may like more the house of uh, Yuval, me more the house of Yuval, Yuval may, uh, may like more the house of Gidon, and so on. And there could be uh, each one uh, has some preference over the houses of the others. And so the general concept that is in the background, both of stable matching and on the house this particular game that I'm describing, which is called the house swapping game, is that you look for a solution which is called the point in the core. A point in the core is an outcome such that no group of individuals can by themselves improve upon this outcome. So for this particular of house swapping, we look for a reallocation of the houses such that there will be no possibility for a subgroup of individuals to look on their own houses, redistribute it differently than what, the, uh, uh, what was reallocated the houses, and each one be better off. 
Okay. And the question was, does this game as an unempty core, is there some allocation? And uh, Scaf, Shapley and Scaf, uh, maybe it should be Scaf and Shapley, yes, ABC, sorry. Uh, uh, Scaf and Shapley uh, developed a general theory of what's called the core of games with indivisibilities and with outside payments. So here, you cannot buy the houses, it's only uh, redistributed, redistributions. And in particular, they proved that this particular house swapping game is an unempty core. Uh, obviously, the general machinery for that is not necessarily because there is a very trivial algorithm for that, which was proposed by David Gale, which is called the top trading cycle. Familiar with that? No? So it's a very simple algorithm, so let's show. Uh, uh, each man points his end on the house he most likes. Okay? So you have a graph between the individuals on the houses. This graph must have a cycle. So basically in this cycle it means that if you trade these houses among the members of these elements of the cycle, each one gets his most preferred house. So take these houses and those individuals out and by induction there is either continued algorithm or do the same. There is another paper by uh, Shapley and Chubik, which uh, somehow is not mentioned in the, no, is mentioned, is referenced in the Nobel Prize uh, citation, but is uh, of uh, uh, lesser degree, which is called market games. That's another class of games that uh, that they study which is very analogous to actual market performance, individuals have endowments, they have utility or they have production functions, they could trade between them the endowment and the question is whether uh, there is something in the core, namely whether there is some allocation of the resources among the individuals or of the profits of the firms such that no subgroup of individuals can improve their outcome by just isolating them from society and trading between themselves. And they give the conditions, relatively weak conditions, that guarantee that in this type of model, the core is non-empty. And each time I already mentioned a few times the core, and I said what is the core, and the core is the set, you have a, a coalitional game, you have a group of individuals, each subset of individuals could force some set of outcomes and you will say that some solution that is proposed by an arbitrator of the society if you want looks on the society and proposes some outcome that this outcome is in the core if there is no subgroup of individuals that can by themselves depart the society and trade between themselves and get or force an outcome that is better for each one of the members of this group. So each one of the previous uh, of the previous cases is an example of economic models in which the core is non-empty. And it is often argued that in these models where the core is empty, there are always type of fractions and instability in the outcome. But unfortunately, we know that there is a lot of uh, instability, there are strikes, there are wars, etc. And the reason is that in most games, the core will be empty. So here we posed few classes of examples which some special structure for which the core was non empty. There was a solution which was stable. Usually there is no solution which is, in many examples there are no such solution. And if we want to think out of the box, out of game theory, we have to think more broadly on cooperative game theory. And indeed, there is one solution which I like most among the, game the, the cooperative game theory, which is called the Shapley value, uh, also by Shapley. And uh, this basically will propose a kind of a solution to any type of game in coalitional form. So, and obviously, as we have seen, there is a lot in this uh, 
in the story that was not only the cooperative game, but also the kind of the incentives of individuals of uh, acting, participating in this type of markets. Yes? Just a clarifying question regarding market games. Are these uh, non-cooperative games? Or? Cooperative games. They're still cooperative Cooperative games. games. So all these models are... All, all these models are cooperative games. There was a little mixture of non-cooperative game, which was when we discussed the issue of incentive compatibility. Because once you see that this is the solution, still the issue is that when you apply non-cooperative, uh, when you apply cooperative games, th there are some information that are private to the individuals, like their preferences. So often we want to think that if we are proposing something, into such a solution, and individuals will have to be revealing their own preferences, you want to make sure that there is no incentive for an individual to misrepresent his preference. So there is a little mixture, a little interplay in this type of theory uh, of uh, non-cooperative games. But most of it is cooperative game. Yes, there was another question here. Any other question? Oh, yeah, so maybe you can comment why you think that the resident market you know, has this uh, Gail Shapley algorithm operating while other markets like the postdoc market in universities doesn't have it. And it still has all these instabilities with offers being made earlier and earlier and so on. I, I don't know how, I, I think often when you make a postdoc, yes, appointment, and you probably make it and you make more than one, right? And I, I'm not sure that your own preference over the candidates are without externalities. So often you would like to have a pair of postdocs that uh, either because you want to work in two different areas and you want to have the diversity, and sometimes because you want them to be in the same area so that they could be more productive together. So there are externalities. And let me point, uh, thank you for the question, because there is also a similar issue with the, uh, with the interns going to hospitals. Because uh, sometimes, basically, when students are already graduating, often you have coupled marries. Cup, coupled, married, couple. married couples. And uh, uh, the married couples have a preference which has externality because they want to be matched to the same thing. Once you insert that, there is no solution that will be stable, okay, if you insert couples. But still Roth was basically aware of this fact, aware of the uh, theoretical difficulties that this causes. But still, understanding these difficulties was trying to help the matching, the interns, uh, the NRP uh, market, to how to overcome it with minimal friction. But there is always then a friction to that. Yes? Yeah. So is there estimates of you know, how fast uh, certain, like the women who are the colleges, reach their uh, best preferences in the sense is it true that uh, the top ones reach their preferences faster than the middle level ones? Um, so the algorithm is running, right? And so um, the women, they are, getting their, uh, they are getting their mates from the men. So can we say something about when do the women get their mate? In the sense that uh, do the top ranked women get them faster than the middle top rank? Top ranked by whom? Yeah. By whom? Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, I guess that is a question. But what I'm trying to think in the, in the college problem too, there is a question of time, and then you have to probably answer, reject, or accept by a given time. So if there is a time component, are there some groups which benefit more than other groups? Uh, um, the, the, the group that benefits is the proposing side of the market. They get the best solution to themselves. Now, in terms of time that you ask in times, in many of these markets that got organized, like some schools in uh, the New York uh, district area, when the, you have the applications, you have the preference, you have the, it, it's essentially you submit your preference and a program is deciding on the allocation. 
you as in both sides. Hmm? When you say you as in both sides. Both sides uh, submit the perfect. Yes? So the, uh, the somewhat vague question, I guess, but, um, um, you said that um, for the side that's doing the rejecting, as the women say, there is, there can be incentive for them to misrepresent their preferences. Now, um, but that's with full information, presumably, if, if they know the whole instance. So what about if they just have some partial information Maybe their own preferences are a little bit more. Is there some systematic way for them to misrepresent their preferences so that they no. cannot do worse and perhaps they do better? I mean, it's a vague question because I didn't say what partial information. Yeah, yes, I see where that goes. Okay. So, so the results that say that there is, it's examples that they say that there is. Okay, there. I am not familiar with any work of. Uh, somebody that will say the preferences are being drawn from some distribution, yes, and you know, don't know this distribution, to what extent this will be phased out, these incentives. But it might, I mean, it's not necessarily a distribution. It could just be, you know, here's a deterministic algorithm. If you know, for example, you know, each woman knows her own preferences, and she also knows that the algorithm is being run exactly in stages, <coughs> yes, sir. the traditional way. It, I mean, for example, here's one question. Is there some deterministic algorithm for the women to sometimes make false rejections, you know, just given their own preferences and what has happened in the past, which guarantees that they do no worse and gives them a possibility to do better? I would guess the answer to that is no. But Without knowing the preferences of others. That's right, but they, but they still have the information of, you know, at round three they got these three no. proposals and so on. Yes. But, I mean, that seems too weak, but then, you know, if, if you know a little bit more, somehow. I think we'll uh, take further questions offline. So let's thank Ibn Amin.